Because aside from helping you look awesome and helping you squish baddies with the greatest of ease, they're also worth a lot of money. Like money. Like money, 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 money! Money! Yeah, like walking around buying stuff money. Like you can make a living money. Like economists studied stuff money. Most types of gamers have probably had the experience of, say, walking into a shop in some Zelda game. And you're like, ooh, new shield. And then the shop owner is like, that will be 200 rupees, please. And then you're like, in many games, most games, in fact, there is a virtual economy. You perform tasks or collect stuff and get paid in a currency which allows you to buy goods, services, or even games within the game. It's more fun than the real economy because you don't have to budget for food, pay your student loans, or do your taxes. Unless you're playing that hip indie game, Starving Liberal Arts Graduate Without a Trust Fund. <laughs> Now, virtual economies are nothing novel. They've had a place in video games since long before Mario was using his noggin to bust open floating question marks for that sweet golden loot. But as games get more immersive and begin to reward us more substantially, which is an extremely complicated thing in its own right, we start to think of those spoils as ours. And that gives them value. Philosophers Hegel and Locke both agree that when a person joins their labor with a thing, the right of ownership is naturally transferred to them. It is a slightly older theory of property and ownership, but it feels particularly applicable to the Immortal King's Boulder Breaker or a Minecraft mansion. What's more is that emergent gameplay practices and even some game developers have started reinforcing the notion that work plus stuff equals ownership. Linden Lab's expansive virtual world Second Life allows players to buy in-game currency with real, actual money. And until a lawsuit over an in-game house, Linden went so far as to state in the user agreement that in-game creations were actually owned by the players that made them. Like owned owned, like how I own my cell phone owned. Yes? No, my AOL dial-up is working fine. As a result, at one point, the sale of Second Life goods was a multi-million dollar industry, with several entrepreneurs making one million actual, real dollars. A more illicit conversion of fake gold into real smackers happens in World of Warcraft. Small companies labor to gather gold or awesome loot and then sell it at a premium. Gold farming, as it's called, is strictly verboten by Blizzard, but is popular enough that many in-game items actually end up on eBay. And cost comparison services have been created to help non-gold diggers get the best deal. That's right, virtual gold bargain hunting. It is a reality TV show just waiting to happen. Tons of games have amazing virtual economies, like EVE Online with Interstellar Credits, Ultima Online, and even, in a weird way, some Zynga games. But it's with Diablo 3 that Blizzard really changed the game. The weird, theoretical, dollar, virtual trading game within a game. Along with Diablo 3, they've opened an official game item auction house. There, players can trade their character's gold, or real dollars, which I mean, let's be honest, they're kind of virtual representations themselves, for arrangements of pixels and bits which make up in-game objects. Now, the super double official developer-supported auction house isn't important because it decriminalizes an already rampant practice. It's important because Blizzard has essentially confirmed that in-game objects have real-world value. From here, the line between virtual economies and real ones will continue to get more pixely and weird. Especially because Blizzard is going to profit from every real dollar transaction made at the auction house. We tend to assign value to objects and ideas like your car, a very expensive grill, the IP to Dawson's Creek, or that patent on toast that you have. I don't know that that one's gonna hold up. You know, legally. But in-game virtual objects sort of straddle the line between objects and ideas. You can't really hold them or put them in a safe. You probably worked super hard fighting a million demons to get them, but you can't really claim that you created them. So for now at least, while our laws sort of stumble around the nuance of their ownership, they still retain a value. I mean, clearly, Blizzard has admitted it. The fact that these virtual objects have real-world value is a weird, bitter, resundant potion for some people to swallow. I mean, Diablo 3, World of Warcraft, Second Life, these are just games. But so is golf. And have you priced a good pair of clubs lately? It is not a bargain. So maybe the next time someone wants to give you a hard time for playing too many video games, you can legitimately tell them, be quiet. Shut your I face. am working on my investment portfolio of magical swords. What do you guys think? Does a player own the objects that they work to acquire in a video game? And should they be able to profit from their sales? Let us know in the comments. And if you really want a challenge, you could try to find the subscribe button with your eyes closed. Nope. More left. More your other left. Yeah, you got it. Raise your hand if you shared our video about Facebook on Facebook.
Let's see what you guys had to say about last week's episode. There were a lot of people who claimed to not have Facebook accounts, and I don't want to say that I don't believe you, but also I kind of don't believe you. In response to Mr. Zarlable's comment from a couple weeks ago, I find that it's actually really important to approach a lot of the stuff that we talk about with a positive attitude, because if you immediately write it off as meaningless, then it makes it hard to really dive into something and find out what about it is really important and exciting and why the people who like it do like it. It's kind of like that Louis C.K. sketch where he says that everything is exciting and no one is happy. There's a lot of negativity that is shoveled onto internet culture and all the related stuff. But if you don't accept it and if you don't try to figure out why people love it, then it keeps you from really understanding how and why it is effective and important. As far as the jokes, I, I don't know. I can't really help you on that one. I think I am very funny. Mr. Natsat describes Facebook a little bleakly, not as a memory storage mechanism, but maybe as a way of dragging your past around with you, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I can see how some people might perceive it that way. So really interesting. Leon K. 1984 describes Facebook as a kind of biographer, which is really interesting and maybe kind of apropos because like a biographer, you might leave some things out and emphasize some other things. Who knows, maybe in a little while there'll be some software where you can just push a button and it'll print out your biography. Azrael Dominoff makes a really interesting point about Facebook being a kind of memory bank where you can view your memories in the context of other people's memories. Bitch, I just, I'm gonna have to take a couple days and think about that one. Really Jamatastic and Metalosaurus kind of duke it out a little bit over Facebook's proper transmission of emotions. I think while looking at your wall and all the tons of stuff that's on there, it's easy to forget that these are people who you know who are expressing things that they actually feel and that while you might not receive it, maybe it is being transmitted. And in a sort of related point, Mr. Monfrey's class makes a point that there is just so much information on Facebook, it's hard to actually gain any real meaning. Uh, and also some interesting stuff about having things end up on Facebook that you might not want to end up on there and that maybe those things become part of your memory and personality against your will. And finally, on the subject of my name, it's actually been in all of the video descriptions, but that's fine. Um, Cool123Cookie also says that I don't look like a mic, which I know, I look like a Jason Lee. Here's an idea. Without Facebook, you might not know who you are. Since we're pretty confident you already know what Facebook is, we're going to spend this part of the episode looking at photos from my recent trip to Portland. What you might not know, though, is how big Facebook really is. As of a few months ago, the social media monolith had over 955 million worldwide users. And of those, 552 million of them are active daily. For comparison, that is roughly the populations of the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, Spain, Germany, and Italy, combined. And not one of them knows what poking does. All of these people are uploading 250 million photos a day, clicking the like button 2.7 billion times, and playing words with friends instead of filing those TPS reports. Yeah. Get back to work. Facebook is for connecting with your friends, letting people know what you're up to, and creeping on your pals like a creepin' creepo. Oh, and also, using Timeline to create an imageified alternate digital version of yourself, thus offloading the less pleasant parts of tending to your own memories. Making memories used to be really hard. It involved pens and paper and, and scrapbooks and buying film and developing film and family photo albums and keeping all of this stuff somewhere in the house like in a trunk or the attic or something. It was just the worst. And because these things are physical, on top of having to put them somewhere, you could only share them with a limited number of people at one time. But even though it makes it easier to do, Facebook didn't invent conspicuous consumption, self-documentation, or the act of sharing heinously boring vacation photo albums. Don Draper invented that. It's called a carousel. People have all always love to advertise what they have, where they've been, and who they know. Because these things are a very, very big part of our identity construction. The clothes we buy, the music we listen to, the car we drive, our hairdo, our beard trimming regimen. These objects and preferences perform a signification. A punk rocker advertises his culture with a mohawk and a businessman with a very expensive watch. Or a fancy vacation, which he'd probably really like to remember. And why would he like to remember his 14-day sojourn to Monte Carlo? Philosopher John Locke's theory of personal identity states that it's because we tend to construct our idea of ourselves, our own identity, based upon what we know and remember of our past experiences. Things which we can't or don't remember, then, are 
not part of our identity. But here's the thing. Facebook does all of this memory and identity construction stuff, and it sort of does it a whole lot better, and to a degree of dissemination that was impossible before the internet. It's tough to say, and estimates vary depending upon who you ask, but the average human brain can hold somewhere between 1 and 10 terabytes of data. Facebook does more than that in photos every hour, and it does it better. Well, better. Actually, yeah, better. No quote fingers better. Just better. I mean, our memories are actually pretty bad. Think about it. If iPhoto had to stop and be like, um, yeah, uh, give me a second. Every time you asked for those photos from the Grand Canyon, and then gave you this blurry mess where, like, some of the colors are wrong and your friend Dave is there, even though he was visiting his mom in Cleveland that week, you'd be pretty miffed. Facebook is doing for your memories what Google did for simple facts, lyrics to songs, and the casts of movies. Which is cool, because like Jeff Goldblum and his closet of all the same suits in the fly, you can use those brain parts for other stuff. Like Adventure Time quotes, or ukulele songs, or both. It's Adventure Time, come on and grab your friends. But here's the other thing. Timeline and photo albums and friend groups and all the other memory sorting goodies give you so many opportunities for broadcasting and constructing yourself. For instance, it's thought that people can maintain between 1 and 200 regular, persistently social relationships. Now, this includes everyone from your closest friends to people you see semi-regularly, like maybe the friendly guy who sells a bagel every Tuesday morning. This number, called Dunbar's number, named after anthropologist Robin Dunbar, describes your brain's cognitive friend limit. Facebook's technological friend limit is 5,000, which is over 33 times the average Dunbar number of 150. So, when you're uploading photos or telling stories or putting things on timeline from before Facebook even existed, you're doing it for yourself, but then also for a group of people potentially much larger than the number you could possibly know. People look down on the photos of children, status updates, and this story of your life business, essentially memory sharing, as stuff people don't care about, or oversharing, or sometimes even dishonesty. But new ways of writing and communication are weird and scary, and this one bridges the particularly awkward gap between the personal diary and the public performance of self, which makes it weirdly both trivial and important. Maybe not important to you, but definitely to at least one person, the person who put it on Facebook, hoping to advertise a specific idea, opinion, event, or who knows what else. Or maybe more significantly, create a browsable digital self that they can use to gain a clearer understanding of where they've been and therefore who they are. Okay. What do you guys think? Is Facebook useful as a memory surrogate? Let us know in the comments. And if you need help remembering to watch our videos, you could always just subscribe. Let me tell you about comments about Homestuck. Let's see what you guys had to say about last week's episode. Greater Fox, you were not kidding. Rock28 says that he experiences some effort justification every time he watches a film by Jean-Luc Godard, to which I respond, really? I could watch Masculine Feminine like a million times, but that probably makes me a liberal arts unicorn. Demet Studios 9007 wants to know who my favorite Homestuck character is. It's Dave. It was Rose. No, Kevin Sevens and Fanny Zero J point out that Homestuck could actually lose a fair amount of its complication if you have been following it as it's been created, not coming into it at the end with 5,000 plus pages. Uh, which is true, but it also has a lot of complicated timedness, complicated plot business, tons of characters, so parts of it are still legitimately complicated. Tamriel31 points out some epically long fanfiction, while Dreadmax points out Inception as an example of really complex cinema. And this really causes an interesting comparison between pieces of media that are needlessly complicated and need fully complicated. And I wonder which of those two examples falls into each of those designations. Mr. Zarlable, I have a response to your question, just not right now. So keep your eyes out. Autism Personified points out that very complicated writing can sometimes be trimmed down to something friendlier. And this reminds me of what I think is Jonathan Franzen's first rule of novel writing, which is the audience is not the enemy. Franzen could maybe take a little bit of his own medicine, but it's still a very valid point. To BJ Waters, I've given your comment much consideration, and to it I respond that that is just like your opinion, man. Garbachev21, what did I say? No spoilers. Biz Gautier, who has an awesome username, makes a point about people lording their accomplishment of having read Ulysses over other people, which I can say, as a person who has done it, that it happens and you shouldn't do it. Well, thank you so much! I mean, it's not its not really us, it's our awesome subscribers, but thank you for the compliment. Um, my name is Mike, by the way. It's nice to meet you, Julius Caesar. Here's an idea. Homestuck is the Internet's Ulysses.
If you've never heard of Homestuck, I've potentially just given you something to do with all of your evenings and weekends for the next two years. Homestuck is a webcomic that's written and drawn by Andrew Hussey. It's about a boy named John and his group of friends who, while playing a game called Suburb, they accidentally you know, open a rift, which summons some meteors, and so to escape the meteors, they have to enter this otherworldly realm called the medium, and there's this ancient battle that's going on, and they meet this other group. Actually